Thank you very much. A very good morning to each one of you and thank you for staying through. I know I'm standing between your break, right? Um, and you had a really tiring morning since 9 o'clock. We've been talking a lot of very, very heavy stuff. Okay. I, 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 I don't know about you, you know, it's, it's really admirable for you to come early morning on Saturday to listen to such talks like this. Um, I hope all of us are doing fine. Are we all okay? Yes, give me a smile we are do- we are, if you are doing okay. Are we okay? Okay, great. I, 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 I'm feeling a bit tired. You know why? Because I just came back from my in-camp training and I know that you look at me and you're thinking, you know, what? On earth, are you still? I mean, why on earth are you still doing in camp, in camp training? You know, I belong to a unit in SAF that a lot of us are actually volunteers. Uh, we have finished our liability, but we still continue to volunteer. And many of us, you know, we actually, you know, we are we are quite old, like, You know, we are forty plus, fifty plus. You know, and then one fine day, one of our colleagues decided that you know, since we haven't done root much for a long, long time, and the guys here will understand what it root, what is uh, what are root marches, he decided that we should go and do root march, la. You know, and so at the start of the in camp, we started, you know carrying full battle order for those guys who understand what I'm talking about. Nah. It's been 30 years since I do a road march, you know, and I thought I'm young. Okay, but after that, just four kilometers, just four kilometers okay, of road march, I come back and my whole body is it's all aching. And then I realized that, you know, I have, I have to I have to run lao la, la, liao, you know. Anyway, so what is it going to do with this talk? Nothing. I just decided that I should talk some rubbish to start us, start us off. Okay, now. My job here, as usual, in an all money sense talk, is try and, you know, try and bring out an application of what we have gone through so far. Okay, at the start of the morning, okay, you have heard Barnabas g- giving us the market outlook. What is a market outlook? A market outlook is like a weather forecast. It's sort of like a weather forecast telling you what is going to happen, what is likely going to happen this year. And the, 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 the market outlook that Barnabas has given us is a 2017 market outlook. It is a forecast and sometimes forecasts can be wrong. We cannot say that the forecast will be 100% correct. It's like, a, it's like a weather, like I said, it's like a weather outlook. Yeah? But it helps you have an understanding of what you might be experiencing as you are investing, you know, the volatility that you might be experiencing, the risk that you might be experiencing over the next 12 months or so. But I just want to emphasize that Many of us here, we are investing longer than just one year. Yes? No? You are just investing for one year? <laughs> I'm sure you are investing longer than that. So we have looked beyond that, that outlook. But it gives us a very good understanding of what we should be experiencing, you know, coming the next 12 months. And if you don't like the risk, some of the risk that you hear, then one way to try and moderate that risk is to buy bonds and put bonds into your portfolio. Because what bond does, besides giving you that income, what bond does is that bond helps the volatility, the ups and downs of the portfolio to be not too bad. Because you are investing long term and you want to be able to stay long term. You don't want to, by the time you reach the, you know, you reach the end when you need the money, you already cannot take it. You get a high attack. Yeah, so bonds helps you, help bonds moderates the up and down of your portfolio so that, you know, while you are investing long term, you can tahan. Okay? Now, that comes to my, my, my then, then we come to my session, okay, which is how then, after hearing all that, do you put that, okay, in application? So, I'm going to start first by talking about retirement planning and some of us may have heard me talk about this before. There are really two phases of retirement planning. Just like in this room, all of us are from different ages. Some of us are younger, some of us are more senior. Okay? Retirement planning means different things to different people. Okay? So there are two phases to retirement planning. Now, assuming that this is your timeline and you are moving from now until the time when you plan to retire. Okay? At whatever age you plan to retire. It could be 55 years old, it could be 60 years old, it could be 65 years old. And when you retire, this could be a recap for many of us. When you retire, you need three things. Okay? When you retire, you really need three things. The first thing that you will need is you will need a fully paid house. The second thing that you will need is you need to have a good medical expense insurance just in case when you go into retirement, well, if we fall sick, then at least we've got good medical expense insurance to take care of that. And the third thing that we need at retirement is, of course, we need money. Because no money, no talk. You need money. Yeah, but these are the three things that you will want to save towards at retirement. And so the first phase of retirement is what we call the accumulation phase. 
And this typically happens to people who are in their maybe 30s or 40 years old. You've got a good 20 to 30 years to save towards that retirement. But there's a second phase to retirement. There's a second part to retirement, and that is the withdrawal phase. Yeah, the withdrawal phase. And this is the phase whereby you have accumulated your capital, and now it is time to draw down. So two phases for the younger ones, accumulating for the more senior withdrawal. Between the two, the withdrawal phase is the more complicated phase. The accumulation phase, from financial planning standpoint, is a lot easier. Right? So I'm trying, I, will, I will try and explain these two phases and how do you invest during these two phases of retirement planning. But I'll spend just a bit more time in the withdrawal phase because that is the part that is pretty complex. So let's start with the accumulation phase. Now, in the accumulation phase, as you are saving towards that capital in retirement, okay, there are many instruments you can use. The first instrument that you can use, of course, I call it an instrument, but really it is your CPF special account. Yeah, because we know that currently your CPF special account gives you a guaranteed 4% return. I say currently. Okay, I say currently because since January of 2008, the special account interest rate is pegged to the 10-year Singapore government bonds plus 1%. Okay, however, the government continues to guarantee it at 4%. So as it is right now, you at least get 4% interest from your special account. It is a good instrument to use to save. But there is a second instrument that some of us might like to use. And that second instrument is an endowment instrument. It is an insurance instrument. Some of us like to buy insurance to save towards our retirement. Well, the returns are not interesting, but it gives you pretty safe. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty safe instrument. It gives you there about, about 3% interest. And if you still want to save, there is a third instrument that you can use, and that is really you invest your money. I mean, after you know you have done your CPF top up to your special account, after you have bought your insurances and you still have money and you want to save towards your retirement, the third thing you can do is you can invest. But in investing, there will be risk. Okay, we all know that there will be risk. And as I've started in the session. Okay, you are really investing long term. And the key to successful investing is that you must stay throughout that investment. Okay? And in order for you to be able to stay throughout the investment and not jump in and out, you must invest into something that is suitable for your risk appetite. How do you know your risk appetite? The three things that you need to know, and I've said it so many times before, and some of you have been coming for Money Sense Talk or find it's very familiar, so it's a recap for you. The three things, the three factors that helps you decide what kind of risk you can take. Firstly, is your need to take risk. Secondly, is your ability to take risk. And thirdly, is your willingness to take risk. So let me go now and elaborate it. First, let's talk about your need to take risk. What determines your need to take risk? Well, your need to take risk is based on your needs for return. If you are investing long-term, and I speak especially to those people who are younger, and you're investing over the next 10, 20 years, and your need for return in order to reach your objective, let's say it's just 2%, meaning to say you only need 2% to be able to achieve your goal. Is 2% very high or low return? Is 2% very high or low return? Well, based on Singapore, I think most of us will generally agree that 2% is no big deal. It's pretty low. And since you only need 2% return, then your need to take risk is then low. Does it make sense to all of us? Yeah, but let's say you need, say, 7 8% or you need 6 7 8% in order to reach your goal. Is that return pretty high? That's pretty high. Yeah, to get 6 7% today is not easy. And I'm not talking about 6 7% one time. I'm talking about 6 7% every year. It's pretty high. And therefore, if you need that kind of return, then your need to take risk to get that kind of return would be high. Does it make sense to all of us? Yeah, good. Okay, so that's the first one, your need to take risk. Secondly, you need to know your ability to take risk because it doesn't mean you need, you can. We may need high return, but we might not have the ability to take that high return. So what determines your ability to take risk? Many things, your age and your time horizon, generally speaking, the younger you are, 
the higher the ability to take risks. Yeah? The more time you have, if you have got 20 years ahead of you, you have pretty high ability to take risks. If you only have one year and you need the money, your ability to take risks is a lot lower. Your financial health. If your financial health is good, okay, you have got a good job, stable income, you know, your debt level is low, you don't owe people money, your ability to take risks is pretty high. Yeah, but if you don't have a stable income, you're an odd job laborer, I'm not that we look down on them, but then, you know, because the income is not stable, then your ability to take risks might be lower. Your physical health also determines your ability to take risks. If you are generally healthy, your ability to take risks is higher. But if your health is not too good, well, you might not be able to take the risk, your heart might not be able to take it. Or, you know, sometimes you need to, you may need money to go to the hospital. You, 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 might not, you might not be able to stay invested for the long term. You might have to sell away the investments in order to fund that medical expenses. Your ability to take risks is lower. The next thing will be your insurance. You have done all your insurance planning properly. You are well covered. Your ability to take risks is higher. But if you have no insurance, your ability to take risks might be lower. Next, your marital status also affects your ability to take risks. You must be wondering why. If you are single, your ability to take risks is higher because you have no commitment, right? But if you are married, with children especially, your ability to take risks drop. Yeah? If you have got two kids, your ability to take risks is lower than someone who no commitment. Of course, if you've got 10 kids, then maybe you have no ability to take risks. Lah. Okay, so your marital status determines your ability to take risks. Liquidity needs. If you need, if you need your money very quickly, that means you have high liquidity needs. Your ability to take risks might be lower. But you have no liquidity needs. That means you can invest for a long time. Your ability to take risks is of course higher. So all these things together helps you determine whether you have that ability to take risks. Your investment amount. Okay, if you are investing one thousand dollars. You tell yourself, no big deal, it's just $1,000. Your ability to take risks is higher. But if you are investing everything that you have, half a million, 300,000, your ability to take risks might drop because that's all that you have. Yeah? So, that's ability to take risks. And the third thing that helps you determine whether, you know, that helps you determine your risk appetite is your willingness to take risks. And in the financial services industry, before you buy your products, whether you go to the banks, you go to the insurance agent, or you go to speak to a financial advisor, usually before you buy a product, they make you do those risk questions. You, under, you, you answer five to seven questions. And based on your answer, we tell you whether you are low risk, middle risk, medium risk, or high risk. Yes? Familiar? Yeah. That particular questionnaire primarily helps you just understand your willingness to take risks. But it doesn't help you understand your need. It doesn't help you understand your ability to really understand what kind of risk you can take, what kind of roller coaster ride that you can take. You have to put these three things together. Let me give you an example. Okay, let me give you an example. Say, for example, you have a high need to take risks and you can take risks, but you don't want to take risks. Should you take risks? Let me repeat. You have a high need to take risk. Okay? You can take that risk, but you don't want, unwilling. Should you still take that risk? Yes or no? Okay, now let me rephrase. Your children, I've, I've done this many, many times, many, many times. Those of you who have listened to this many, many times, you should be able to know the answer by now, okay? Your children need to study for exams. Can study but comes back one day and tell you, I have no feel. Don't feel like studying. Unwilling to study. So what do you tell them? You just, you must study. Then how come just now you say no? <laughs> when it comes to studying, you say yes. When it comes to investments, you say no. So you get it. Well, if they need to study, if they can study, even if you are unwilling, I'm quite sure most parents wouldn't say that. Up to you lah. Go with your feel lah. Don't feel like, don't feel like. La. You know, life is about feelings, you know. You don't, say, you don't say such a thing, right? You will obviously, of course, as good parents, you will try and encourage them to study. You won't push them, you know. But you will tell them that if you don't study, these are the consequences. Are you prepared to bear the consequences? You will try your best to encourage them because you know they need to and they can. And even if they are unwilling, we must try and encourage them to study. Yes, or no? See, this one all of us understand. 
So if you need, you can, even if you're unwilling. You actually should. Okay? But, well, if you don't want, then you have to bear the consequences. Then you just have to, in investments, if you need and you can, if you're unwilling, you just have to accept a lower return. You have to make adjustments to your financial plan because you might not be able to reach it because your returns will be lower. Let's go to, let's swing to the other extreme. Now you don't need to take risks. All you need is 2%. All you need is 3%, let's say. That's all you need. Okay? And you also cannot take the risk. You don't have time. Okay? Your health is not too good. Financially, not very stable. Not earning an income anymore. Okay? Your health, like I mentioned, not too, not too good. So your ability to take risks is low. You don't need to take risks. You cannot take risks. But you gung-ho. You want. You're very willing to take risks. Should you? You don't need. You cannot. But you want. Should you? This one we know, right? Your children don't need to take drugs. Cannot take drugs. But one day come back home and say, I got the feel, eh? I want to smoke ganja. What do you tell them? You won't even tell them. You slap them straight away. <laughs> right? If you don't need, you cannot. Even if you want, you should not. Can you see why these three factors must be put together in order to help you determine what kind of risk profile, what kind of risk you should take. Are we all okay with that? Yeah, I keep repeating this because many of us, we just invest based on what we think we need. I think I want 7%. Okay, I go and invest in an instrument that gives me 7%. You might need, but you might not be able to take that risk that comes along with it. Are we all okay? Now, after you have done this, okay, after you have done this, the next step then, once you know your risk profile, the next step then is to invest in a portfolio that is suitable for your risk appetite. So let's assume that in this entire auditorium here, all of you here, okay, all of you here, you have no need to take risks. You cannot take risks and you also don't want. Okay? Therefore, you are pretty conservative. Am I getting all of us? You don't need, you cannot, you also very unwilling. Therefore, your risk appetite, you are pretty conservative. Okay? And what should you invest in? Okay? Before I go into this case study, you should invest into something okay, that has got a lot lower volatility. Does it make sense? But if in this auditorium, if you have high need and you can and you're very willing, then you should invest into something that is a lot more aggressive. I'm sure it makes sense, right? Okay, so now we, 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 let's, let's practice, okay? Let's see whether we all understand this, okay? So this is a, it's a, very, a very simple case study. Okay, now... Let's say this person need to take risks. Okay, in terms of need to take risks, in terms of need to take risks, he wants five hundred thousand in twenty years time. Okay, in terms of need to take risks, he wants five hundred thousand in twenty years time. He is making an initial investments of fifty thousand dollars. Let's say, okay, and he's prepared to save eight thousand dollars every year. Therefore, the return he's need, he needs in order to reach half a million is about 6.5% a year. Get a picture? Yeah, this guy is young. Okay, remember, we are talking about the accumulation phase. He needs half a million in 20 years' time. He's prepared to start with 50000 and every year he invests $8,000. And in order to reach the half a million, he needs 6.5% per year. Is this high or low return? Pretty high, pretty high, yeah? Pretty high, yeah? Now, so if he needs high return, therefore he needs, his need to take risks is high. So therefore he has got a high need to take risks. So we all get it, right? Okay, now, the second factor, ability to take risks. Now, this guy is 35 years old. This guy who wants to invest $8,000 every year, start with 50000 wants to reach half a million in 20 years' time, he's actually a 35 years old person. Has very stable job, low debt, okay? He has got six months emergency fund, meaning to say that he has got six months of his monthly expenses in cash. He's physically very healthy, sufficient insurance cover, he's married with two kids, average Singaporean, no short-term liquidity needs at all. That means he can invest for a pretty long time. Therefore, what do you think about his ability to take risk? High or low? Pretty high, pretty high. I would say he has got pretty high ability 
to take risks. Let's look at his willingness. Okay, his willingness, he's very willing to take risks. So in this case, this guy has got high need, high ability, high willingness. Therefore, what kind of investment portfolio should he invest in? Those that gives higher return, higher risk, or lower return, lower risk. Which one? The higher return one because he needs it and he can take it. Okay, he's able to take that higher risk. We all got it, right? And if you look at the sample of these three portfolios, this is how an aggressive portfolio will look like. So this particular example, he probably should invest in something like this, whereby you can see most of the money is actually in commodities and in equities. Okay, in commodities and equities, you can see about 85% into the more risky instruments with the remaining 15% into something safer such as bonds. If you swing to their extreme for a person who doesn't like to take the risk, need not, cannot, and he doesn't like, then this person probably should invest into something like that with most of the monies okay, into more volatile instruments such as equities. Okay, oh, sorry, let me say it again. With more of the money invested into safer instruments such as bonds and lesser of the money investing into equities. This will be something safer. Are we okay so far? Yes or no? You all look like stunned to me. Are you okay? okay I, I know break is coming, break is coming. Okay, stay with me, okay? Stay with me, just a while more. Yeah? Now, I've been talking about risk the whole morning. And really, risk means different things to different people. Because to me, what is high risk could be low risk to you. What is low risk could be high risk to me, yeah? The word risk in English is pretty subjective. So when we talk about risk, what do we usually mean? Actually, when we talk about risk, we usually mean volatility risk, which means the ups and downs of your, your, your portfolio. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, sometimes it's doing well, it goes up, sometimes it doesn't do well, it goes down. That is a measurement of risk. And in financial language, volatility is usually measured by this thing called standard deviation. Okay? Again, a very thin technical word, but it just means expected volatility. So if you are investing into something that is of a much higher risk, like this aggressive portfolio, look at the volatility. You will expect volatility to be about plus minus 20%. What does that mean? That means to say in a good year, your portfolio might go up 20%. On a bad year, it might come down minus 20% relative to the average. Lah. Yeah? So it goes up 20%, it comes down minus 20%, but on average, it gives you about 6.5%. That is an example of what it means to be high risk. So if you want to invest in something like that, you've got to imagine, can you take this roller coaster ride? It goes up 20%, it comes out 20%, it goes up 20%, it comes out 20%, and on average, you get about 6.5%. Yeah, if you say that, I don't like it, I will vomit, I will puke then this is probably not for you. Yeah? But look at the one that is conservative. The volatility is about plus minus 3%. Meaning to say the expected up and down of this portfolio, it goes up 3%, it comes down 3%, it goes up 3%, it comes down 3%. On, on average, you are getting about 4% return. Are we okay so far? You can see that the volatility is not so much. So this is a good explanation of what risk is all about. I'm going to take a pause right now and say this. I started in the morning by saying that when it comes to planning for your retirement, there are really two phases, the accumulation phase and the withdrawal phase. And for the last 20 minutes or so, I've been primarily talking about the accumulation phase. And I'm really speaking to the people who are younger. You have maybe a good 20 years more before you retire. Okay? And the way you invest towards your retirement is a lot simpler. Yeah? And what kind of portfolio you should go in really depends on your risk appetite. And how do you measure your risk appetite? It is determined by your need, your ability, and your willingness to take risk. Okay? The key to successful investing in this case for you is that whether good times, bad times, you stay throughout. You don't jump in and out because you might jump in and out and, uh, in, in, uh, at the wrong time. Okay, and you are not going to make the returns. But in order to make sure that you are able to sit through and not jump in and out, you've got to make sure that you are in a roller coaster ride that's suitable for you. Okay, so far. Okay? Now, now I'm going to talk primarily about let me, the withdrawal phase. 
Okay, the withdrawal phase. This applies to people who are into retirement. Okay, you are already in your 50s, 60s, okay, and you have accumulated a sum of money, okay, and it is time right now for you to withdraw. How then do you manage your portfolio? Because you see, for the retirees, the risks that they face as compared to the accumulators are pretty different. Okay? What are some of the risks retiree face? Okay, firstly, market risk. You face market risk. Okay, market risk means the ups and downs of the portfolio. Secondly, longevity risk. Okay, because living too long is a problem. You, your money might run out before you do. The third risk that retiree face would be withdrawal risk because there is a risk of you spending too much at the early stage of your retirement. Okay, leaving not enough to spend towards the end. Okay, and of course, the fourth risk that retiree face will be interest rate risk. Okay, especially in Singapore, when the interest rate environment is very low, yeah, you might not get enough returns from your savings. Okay, and last but not least, inflation risk because, well, you know, your money is becoming smaller and smaller. Yeah? So these are the five risks that retiree face. So how do you, as you go into retirement, how do you rebalance your portfolio? How do you rebalance your portfolio in this phase of life to cope with the five risks that we talk about? Now, I'm going to give you two case studies. And these are actually two real numbers. That um, They are real numbers from the clients that we have worked with. So the first case study applies to people we have, which have a smaller retirement fund, about half a million. Okay? Now, you will all agree with me that half a million is not a lot in Singapore for retirement, yeah? Uh, no, it's a lot, yes? Yeah, half a million is really not a lot in Singapore for retirement. And for this particular retiree, he has about 350,000 cash with about, about uh, 350,000 cash with about 150,000 in his CPF. How then do we manage the retirement, uh, the retirement money? Okay, so take a look at this. As I mentioned, he has got about 150,000 in his CPF, and at a certain age, uh, he will have to buy CPF life. Specifically, at age 65, he will have to buy his CPF life. And then for the rest of his 350000 okay, what we did is that we used 150000 to buy an immediate annuities. He takes another 150000 to buy a, something like an annuity, but it's, um, it's deferred, it's not immediate. That means it will pay out after a few years. Okay, and the remaining 50000 he actually invested in a medium risk portfolio. Okay, so for this particular retiree, okay, like I said, this is a real case. This gentleman, what he wants to do is that he wants to slow down. Okay, as he ages, he wants to slow down, finally stopping work completely at age 65, coinciding with CPF life. Okay, but meanwhile, while he's slowing down, he still wants to receive an immediate income payout of about $500 per month and then slowly stepping up to $1,000 per month from age 60. In short, at 55 years old, he wants to receive a passive income of about $500 per month. When he hits 60 years old, he wants to have a $1,000 per month. And then when he reaches 65 years old, he wants to completely retire with about $2,000 $2,400 per month. That's his aim. Okay, that's his aim for this particular gentleman. Now, so with that kind of allocation, okay, with this kind of allocation, 150,000 CPF life, 150,000 into a immediate annuities, with 150,000 into a deferred annuities, with 50,000 into an investment, okay, the payout looks like this. Okay, you can see from age 55 onwards, the immediate annuity will pay him about $500 per month. At age 60, it will go up to be $1,000 per month because the deferred annuity will start to pay out. And then at age 65, because the CPF life starts to pay out, okay, he will have about $2,400 per month throughout and his entire lifetime. Okay? Take a look at this table. Okay, this is an interesting table. This is the total income that he will receive. So at age 60, okay, the total income he received at age 60 is about $30,000, assuming about $500 per month times 12 months. It's about 6,000. Five years later, he would have received 30,000 in total at age 60. And just in case he decides to die at age 60, okay, just in case he decides to die at age 60, okay, he will still have about 500,000 left behind unused because of his NOT plan, because of his CPF life. The unused portion will be paid out to his beneficiaries. He will still leave behind about 500,000. 
Let's assume that this gentleman dies at age 75. Okay, so at age 75, he would have collected total income about 389,000. Okay, and he would have left behind about 330,000. All the unused portion of his annuities plus his investment would have grown. If he decides to go at age 85, which is the average life expectancy of Singaporean going forward, he would have collected about 700,000 worth of income with about 350,000 left behind, untouched, unused. Now, so if you look at this table, it's interesting because it tells you that the longer you live, the better you are. So if you go into a plan like this, you better live longer because your total collection is much better. Okay, so this is how a retirement portfolio will look like for a person with about 500,000 and going into retirement. Are we okay so far? Yeah? Okay, now let me show you the last, second and last case study. This is for people whom they have more money. Okay? They have more money. They have more than half a million. How then can they rebalance their retirement portfolio to prepare for retirement? Okay? All of you here looks like you belong to this category. You have more money. Okay? So this is a guy. It's a bit more complicated. Okay? And again, these are real numbers. Okay? So this guy has a retirement income objective of $10,000 per month for the first five years. That's what he wants. And he wants to reduce to $8,000 per month for the next 10 years. Makes sense because for most retirees, when they are, when they are just retired, they are, they are healthy, they are young, you know, and, all that, and they want to do more things. So for this guy, he wants $10,000 per month. Okay, and then reducing to $8,000 per month. And then finally to $6,000 per month till age 83 years old. He wants to make sure that his income is adjusted for inflation, which we use 3%. This income must last or at least 25 years. And finally, after he decides to die at the end of 25 years, he still wants to leave behind $1 million for his loved ones. Are we okay? All of you look like this is what you want, right? <laughs> I'm sure it's all what we want, right? This is what we want, right? I'm sure. Yeah? Okay, so, let, okay, let me say, let me say this, okay? The first example I show you is for people with a smaller amount. Nah. This is for someone who is more able to, okay? Now, of course, in this auditorium, I'm quite sure there are people who are in that category. Of course, there are people who might, who might not have so much, but just two examples, okay, just to help you understand. Okay, so this is what he wants, but let's look at what he has. Of course, he has got the assets. Okay, so he has a drawdown assets of cash of about 900,000 cash, shares, 300,000, managed investments, meaning to say unit trust, ETF, you know, and all that, about 400,000. Add up together, this guy has got about $1.6 million. Of course, he has got CPF Life that pays out 1000 per month for him. Okay, and he has got an investment property that gives him about $2,000 per month. So this guy quite a side. Yeah, he got, he got, he got assets. La. Okay, and also, like many of us, he has bought some endowment plans which will mature uh, 2016. This is the old case, so it's last year. And some, uh, another endowment that will mature in 2020, both maturity value of about 100000 each. Now, risk profile. In terms of risk profile, this particular person is a moderate risk profile. What do I mean by moderate? Now, in the earlier part of my presentation, I took you through this need, ability, and willingness to take risk. This way of, measure, uh, this way of measuring what kind of risk profile you are really applies to the younger generation. But as we go into retirement, the way to measure risk profile changes. The way to measure risk profile is based on how reliable you want your income to be. The more reliable you want your income, then the lower risk appetite you have. Okay, so in this case, this guy wants a safe retirement income floor of about 40 to 50 percent. What that means is that for the income that is coming in between six to ten thousand, for this guy, at least 40 to 50 percent die die must have. That means he must have about 4,000, 5,000 every month. Die, die must have. The rest of it, he accepts some variability. Am I clear here? Am I clear? I read Chuan already, you know. Are you, are you, am, I, am I clear? Okay, so for example, let's say, okay, let's say you want $5,000 per month income. Okay, but you say that, oh, this $5,000 income that you want, 4,000 die, die must have. Then actually you are very conservative because you cannot accept a lot of variability. Yeah, but let's say you want $5,000 per month income for your retirement. But out of this 5000 income that you need, you say that, ah yeah, 1000 I die, die, must have. The remaining 4000 okay law, if the market is good, then I eat abalone. If the market is bad, then I eat porridge. 
So you can accept a lot more vulnerability than you are more, a, a lot more aggressive. Are we okay? But this guy, he wants in between 40, 50. Most Singaporeans, like, you ask them choose left, choose right, they choose centre one. <laughs> That's us. Uh. Okay, so this guy, like most of us, okay, he, he's moderate, okay, about 40, 50% of variability. So this is this guy's risk profile. Now, based on what this guy wants, how then do we manage his retirement portfolio? Okay, the next slide I'm going to show. Please don't step out. Please don't get up and walk out, okay? And please don't comatose because there are a lot of numbers. Okay, but you just follow me slowly. Okay, you should be able to understand. Okay, don't, don't, don't go wah. Okay, don't go. Uh. Okay. I already tell you, don't go wah already. Uh. <laughs> okay, so based on what this guy wants, okay, effectively follow me. Okay, I know there are a lot of numbers, but follow me. Okay, what we have done is that we have spread whatever he has over seven buckets. Okay, so you have one bucket, two bucket, okay, three bucket. Let me move on. Okay, four, five, six, seven bucket. Can you see? All together, there are seven bucket. Can see or cannot see? Balik, huh? one more time. Huh? So you have one bucket, income bucket, two, three, okay, four, five, six, seven bucket. And all together, if we add the monies that are in this bucket, it is about $1.5 million. Can you see? How much did that guy have just now? We saw. He has about 1.6 million. We need not use his 1.6 million. He only needs about 1.5 million. So the 1.5 million is spread over these seven buckets. And these buckets will be used over his entire lifetime until he kicks the bucket. That's right. Okay? So how do we split? Huh? You see, over here, bucket six, we put in 200,000. Bucket five, 94,000. Bucket four, this amount. Bucket three, this amount. Bucket two, this amount. Bucket one. And income bucket, 340,000. Different buckets invest in different things. Make sense? Okay, so the first bucket, income bucket, 340,000, actually invest, we actually buy an immediate annuity for him. And that's not an investment, it's an insurance instrument. Immediate annuity, 340,000. Okay, and the second bucket, you can see 329178 is invested into a portfolio that gives him 1.5%. Very, very low. Okay, in the next bucket, bucket two, it is invested into something that will give him every year 3.5%. Bucket three, 5.5. Bucket four, 6.5. Bucket five, bucket six, or 6.5%. So the later buckets are invested into things that are of a higher return, but you would expect a higher risk. Does it make sense for all of us? Yes or no? Okay, now follow me very, 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 very slowly, okay? Because I know this is complex, but this is, I promise you, this is almost like the last slide. Okay, then, then we are done. So give your 100% energy into this. Huh? Okay, so in the income bucket, the objective is this. Huh? Okay, the income bucket, together with bucket one, will give this guy his retirement needs, the retirement income for the immediate five years. Monies that he needs in his retirement for the immediate five years will always come from the income bucket and bucket one. Am I clear? No. Balik, one more time. Okay? Every month he needs an income, right? To, for retirement, right? So he needs to draw down from some investments, right? Okay? Where does this money come from? It comes from the investments in income bucket and bucket one. This amount of money, these two buckets, is the bucket that we use to draw out money every month to fund this guy. Let's call this guy David. Okay, let's call this guy David. Okay, so for David, we draw down from these two buckets to give him that monthly income that he needs for the immediate five years. Am I clear? Okay, so because 340000 is invested into immediate annuity, it will pay out immediate Right? Immediate, you buy this month, next month it pays. Immediate NOT. Plus, this is the bucket, think of it like a bank account as well, that will collect money from where? From his rental property because he has a rental property that pays him $2,000 per month, right? So his rental property income, $2,000, plus the immediate NOT that's going to pay out, okay, is going to give this guy called David about $40,000 per year, which is about $3,000 plus per month, nah. Are we okay so far? But David needs more than that. For the first five years, how much income does he need? 
10,000, which is about 120,000 per year, right? So he, the, this income bucket only gives him about 40,000. He needs another what? He needs another like 80 over 1,000 per year, right? So where did we draw down from? We draw down from bucket one. You see bucket one started at 329. We start to draw down about 80,000, left 251. We draw down another 80,000, left 169. Can you see? We are drawing down about 80,000 plus about 40,000 here. That will give David about $120,000 per year. Am I clear? You see this 120,000 increasing, that's because of inflation, eh? because we're trying to inflation adjust it, okay? So, okay, so far, you're following me, eh? Okay, so if you add this 40,000 plus about the 80,000 that he draws down, he will have 120,000. So we begin to draw down, draw down, left 80,000. And actually, the next year should be zero. This number shows what happened at the end of the first year, at the end of the second year, at the end of the third year, yeah? So from 329, at the end of the first year, left 251. At the end of the second year, left 169. At the end of the third year, left 83,000. Actually, at the end of the fourth year, it should be zero because we draw like 80,000, right? But it goes back up to 93,000. Can you see? Can you see or cannot see? Can you see? How come it goes back up? Because the year is 2016. If you remember, he has got an insurance endowment of 100,000 that matures already. So it comes in for him. Okay, so it comes in for him and therefore it goes back up to 93,000 and draw down one more time, zero. This bucket is completely habis, finished already. Am I clear? Yes, but, but David has a second bucket which he puts in 183,000. It grows at 3.5%. What gives you 3.5%? A portfolio that primarily maybe about say 60-40 bonds, 60% equities, 70% equities with about 30-40% bonds will give you a 3.5% net return. Okay, so this 183 after 5 years uh, would have grown to about 190,000 thereabout. Are we okay so far? Oh, sorry, let me say that again. This 183,000 after five years, would have grown, grown to 218,000. Am I clear? Yeah, because it starts to grow, right? 183, 190, 197, 203, 211, 218, because it's growing at 3.5%. By the time, at the end of this fifth year, bucket one will be zero. What we do now is we transfer 218,000 into bucket one. That means now I change investment from 218 instead of investing into a 60% equity, 40% bond portfolio, I now take the 218, I invest in a 1.5% instrument. Am I clear? All these things you see grey colour is actually in bucket one. Am I clear so far? Okay, I'm going a bit slower because it's, I'm trying to, 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 at the end, I will draw a lesson for all of us. Okay, So it, now from 218, I will draw down about 80,000, 90,000 again. So it becomes 151. Then I draw about 80, 90,000, left about 90,000. Why am I drawing down 80, 90,000? Because I'm always adding on to the income bucket to give David the 120,000. The income bucket will always give that 40, 50,000. Okay, so at the end of this year, it should be zero. But it goes back to 132. Why? Because this is year 2020, right? Yeah, and year 2020, the endowment mature. Second endowment mature again. So you can see, it goes back to 132. We draw down left 68. By the end of year 10, bucket 2 also finish. Am I clear? You see here, at age 65, the income bucket actually jumped from 42 to 54,000. Why? Because age 65 is where CPF life starts to pay out. So income bucket has got more money. And because it has got more money, we can draw down a bit lesser from bucket two. So bucket two is finished at the end of year 10. Are we done? Are we okay? Yes. But we have got bucket three, right? Bucket three would have grown for 10 years already. So 219 grow at 5.5, it will be 308. Yes. Uh, sorry, it will be 374. Okay. And then it will, again, this 374 be transferred to bucket one. Transfer into something that give 1.5 and now it is drawing down 308, 2371, 6383, 0, finished already. But now bucket 4 would have grown for 20 years at 6.5 to 266, then it starts to draw down, become 0 already. Then bucket 5 would have grown for 25 years 
Okay, and it is now 334. We transfer to bucket one, starts to draw down, becomes zeros. The process continues. Are you all getting my point? At the end of the 25 years, this is 25 years really, at the end of 25 years, bucket one, two, three, four, five, all finish. But if David is a good client, he's supposed to die now. (laughs) Because that's the plan. Right? That's the plan, right? Because he says he wants 25 years of income. So at this year, it's zero. All the bucket finished. The only two buckets left is actually the income bucket that will never finish because it's an NOT and it's CPF life. Okay, and bucket six. But otherwise, all the bucket finished. He is supposed to die. But if he is a disobedient client and he refused to go, never mind. Why? Does he still have money? Yes, because his income bucket is still giving him money. That's the income bucket. Okay, and he has got bucket six, which over the years, over 25 years, okay, is expected to grow to a million dollars. If he dies, if he's a quiet client, very quiet one, he dies here. This, his last bucket is already about a million dollars. He's supposed to give it to his children, right? His children will say, yes, he's gone. And they have one million dollars left, okay? And he still have a property, right? But if David is a bad client and David doesn't go, then the only thing that will happen will be the children, well, now talk about see, you know? Why, why still haven't died? But David is it, okay because David has got one million dollars here, okay? And he's still drawing some money from the income bucket. Can you see? So it takes care of his longevity risk. Are we okay? What, what's my point of uh, showing you this, all these numbers? You know, we started the session by talking... I mean, this whole event uh, is about rebalancing your retirement portfolio. Okay? And we are always told that as you become older and older and older, you should have lesser and lesser money in bonds. Yes? Yes or no? It's a standard question. How does a retirement portfolio look like? What is a, I mean, how does the portfolio of a retiree look like? You should have lesser and lesser in bonds. Sorry, lesser and lesser in equities. More and more in bonds. As you retire because you cannot take the risk, therefore you start to shift more and more money from equities into bonds. Does it make sense? And is that correct? It's correct generally. It's correct. Because as we grow older, we don't like the up and down the market. Right or not? Yes or no? You know, when I was much younger, I loved the roller coaster ride. When I was in the army, I had a chance to jump down from a plane, airborne. Now, I don't even dare to take a roller coaster. Because, lao liao, as you become older and older, your heart can't take the ride anymore. You might think that you can take, like me, I think I'm young, because I look quite young. But, I look quite young, not, not correct, man. I look quite young. But in a few years' time, I'll be drawing, I'll be 55, you know, I'm 47 years old, this year, we young, oh, I know. <laughs> but, you know, I may think young, but I know that I am not. That's why I started the story, the root march, because whole body aching. Right? So, yes, it's true that as we, as we become older and older, it is true that we don't like the volatility. It is true that we are switching from more equities to bonds. I've got three minutes. Oh, thumbs up. <laughs> okay. But never mind. Okay. It is correct. It is correct. It is correct. However, what am I showing you this? Can you see this guy is still invested 6.5%? Can you see 6.5%? A lot of his monies are still in equities, you know. Can you see? Rebalancing a retiree portfolio is not so simple, especially when you have money. More money, more problem. La. <laughs> it's true. And you have higher need of income. Because if you start to switch everything into bonds, the return will not be as high. You might have to accept a lower income. So what, 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 what are we trying to do here? We are trying to, for monies that are immediately needed over the next five years, yes, buy safe stuff. NOTs, 1.5%. They are 100% bonds. But monies that you don't need immediately over the next two, next bucket two, bucket three, bucket four, bucket five, these are monies that you don't need until the next 10, 15, 20 years time. Can you see? You don't need it you can still invest in equities because you have time. And so whilst it is generally correct to say that 
as you become older, you start to rebalance your portfolio to something safer like bonds, it is a very simplistic ex- explanation. In truth, it is not so simple. In the case of David, we can still invest in equities. He needs to invest in equities because David wants 10000 per month, going down to 8000 going down to 6000 Does it make sense? Okay, so I hope that gives you a sense of rebalancing. Otherwise, we walk away thinking that when I'm younger, I'm equities. When I'm older, everything goes to bonds. It is not so simple. It's a general answer, but it is not so simple. Are we, are we all right? I don't have much time left, but I really do want to show you this video. I must show you this video, okay, because... Uh, okay, okay, I skip all this. Okay, show this video. I'm going to click, okay, and I, I want to show this video, and you just enjoy it, okay? Some of us might have watched this video before. This is based on a true story. Okay, it is in, unfortunately, it is uh, a true story based in Taiwan. Okay, and therefore it is in Mandarin, but there is English subtitle. Okay, so if you don't understand English, you just read the subtitle. Alright, and now I'll come and just close up in 30 seconds and we are, we're done, okay? It's always good to be young, isn't it? Because when we are young, we have dreams. Yeah, but, you know, as we grow older, you know, we have responsibilities, for those, especially for those of us who are parents, you know. We spend our time busy at work, we come back home, we're busy with our kids, and sometimes along the way, our dreams are gone. And I was, as I was preparing this presentation, you know, I was thinking, you know, I really have to show this video because, you know, we're talking about retirement planning, but it's not just about rebalancing your financial portfolio, because that is the easy part. And retirement is not just about money. Agree? You can have money. Obviously, you are here, you have money. La. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. 
But even as we think about rebalancing our portfolio, maybe it's time to rebalance our life. Yeah, because what is retirement without living our dream, you know? And so for whatever dreams that you have, maybe when you're a bit younger, you know, and we don't have get a chance, and I speak especially to the, the, the more senior people, because those of us who are younger, we, we, still, we still have time. But for those of us who are really retiring, I mean, besides rebalancing your financial portfolio into bonds and all these things, I encourage you, rebalance your life. Go and use that money and live the life. And live that dream. Otherwise, that retirement portfolio is of no use. All right? Thank you very much. I'm sorry you went a bit late, yeah? but I hope you enjoy yourself. Thank you.